So moved. The second. motion's been made by Mr. Rutherford. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Coyle. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any not in favor? All right, motion carries. Number three on our agenda is to consider the resolution for revenue bonds. Do we have our speaker here? Mr. Woods is going to address Mr. this. Mr. Woods, all right. Good evening. Hi. Um, I have Dwight Salisbury with uh, Ross Sinclair on the phone with us. Uh, we've had some a few technical issues tonight, so he is on here. If we have any questions, um, we're asking to approve a resolution um, to be able to sell bonds for the new ATC Center. Um, you, you've been provided with the resolution in advance. Any questions? Mark, do you want to read this? Would you like me to read this? I'm happy to read it if you'd like. I do not have a copy if you'd like to read it for us, or I can read it either way. Let Mark, let Mr. Woods uh, read it okay. on the record. If that's, uh, I think that would be good. I'm happy to have you read it. It's up your, right up your alley. Yeah. All right. We are asking to approve a resolution of the Board of Directors of the Madison County School District Finance Corporation relating to and providing for the issuance of $17,515,000 principal amount subject to a permitted adjustment of $1,751,500 of special obligation bonds, school building revenue bonds in accordance with section 58.180 and 162.120 through 162.290 and 162.385 of the Kentucky Revised Statutes to provide funding funds for school building purposes, providing and determining the duty of said corporation in connection with the operation of the school property, the creation of funds sufficient to pay the principal of an interest on said revenue bonds as and when they mature. The creation of adequate maintenance and insurance funds, authorizing and approving the execution of continuing disclosure and tax compliance procedures, and authorizing the execution of a lease of such foregoing property to the Board of Education of the Madison County School District. All right, so we need a motion. Can I have that back? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. My agenda. Thank you, Mr. Woods. And just to clarify, this is the Richmond ATC that we are discussing. That is correct. Discussing. Yes, you are mm -hmm. correct. Good job. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, I need a motion to adopt the resolution authorizing the insurance of revenue bonds. So moved. The motion has been made by Mrs. Cobb. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Rutherford. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, any nays? All right, motion carries. Thank you. No, thank you. All right, next on our agenda, our very quick agenda, number four, to adjourn. I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion's been made by Mr. Rutherford. Is there a second? Second. All right, second by Mrs. Coyle. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? All right, the meeting is adjourned. Quiet in here. Yeah. Where's Randy when we need him? Yeah. <laughs> you got about four minutes of this start our next meeting. Mm -hmm. sure are you guys here to speak tonight during our meeting and if anyone's here I want to make sure that you guys know to fill out the form that's located right out front I have yours okay I, I didn't I just want to make sure if you wanted to that we gave you your opportunity and that you knew the protocol just to make sure hi <laughs> Mind. 
so, um, I was still sitting with color on my hair at 4.30. Oh, no. Thank God it was across the street. I told her, she didn't cut it. I said, you, I don't have time to cut it. I said, I gotta go. Oh, I gotta get out of this and go. Okay, so did y'all land? Uh-oh. Yeah. I need help. I'm out. I need Jacob. Is he back there? Yeah, he's back there. Uh -oh. I clicked that. That's what it brought me to. Hey, Jacob. Uh-oh. Oh, there we go. Lord, he's helping me. Oh, thank you. Okay, we're good. Lord, help me. Thank you, though. I clicked out of the X, and it took me completely out. Thank you. I'll do the same thing. Because <laughs> I'm used to, I'm just used to Microsoft. Yeah. I'm fixing out of everything. Becky's all calm and cool over there. She's used to Be careful, it means I'm saving up all the questions. Good, that's good, that's good. All right, here we go. All right, I'd like to call this meeting to order the Madison County Board of Education. This is our regularly, regular scheduled meeting for tonight, our August 4th meeting. It is a special called meeting. Um, the first thing that will do is a one I call the meeting to order and second is our vision mrs. Cobb, would you like to do our vision please sure Madison County Schools in partnership with the community strives to equip educators and students with the skills to lead by example develop and speak with a unique voice and explore their academic curiosity to make a positive impact on our community and world Thank you, Mrs. Cobb. Now, before we move on on our agenda, I want to remind everyone that we have had our agenda for many days. We have looked over it. We have, as a board, have been given the opportunity to ask questions, whether it to be to Mr. Woods or Dr. Gillum or whoever it may concern. So if we don't ask questions tonight, I want to make sure everyone is under the understanding that we have probably asked many questions, but we will possibly ask many more tonight. So, moving on on the agenda is number three, our public comments. And I do believe, Jeannie, right, we have someone. Ms. Centra. All right. Come on up. Welcome. Thank you. Will you please identify yourself for our uh, Facebook group and for everyone in our audience today? Yes, I will. My name is Susan Centra. Um, I'm the pres president of the Madison County Education Association. Um, I'm also a parent of three kids, this eighth grader, second grader, and sixth grader, headed into this interesting school year, right? All right, uh, before I begin tonight, I wanted to let to say thank you all to our leadership um, and our administrators across the district who have been working diligently on plans that continue to change as information changes. Um, I know this has been a difficult summer and I believe that everyone is doing the best that we can to do what's right for our students and our teachers and our community. And like every other teacher in the district, I want to get back in the classroom. Um, I think about my students. I know that some of them have incredibly difficult times at home. I know they miss their friends. I know that they need some sense of normalcy. And I just miss them. We all do. And you know, Dr. Gillum um, has said in our conversations multiple times that teachers are nurturers and planners. Um, and not being able to take care of our kids 
in that way, in the way that we normally can, or being able to plan for what that will look like, is incredibly difficult given who we are. And he's not wrong. This has been rough. Uh, however, as much as we want to get back to our kids, we don't feel safe doing it. We don't feel safe for our students that we want so desperately to see. We don't feel safe for our own children, who many of them are also students in our schools. We don't feel safe for our families, and we don't feel safe for ourselves. MCA sent out a survey to our members, and of the over 400 responses we received, 80% of our teachers do not feel safe returning to in-person instruction. 80%. Look, we're team players. We always have been. That's a huge part of who we are. And we're used to flying a plane in the midst of being built. It being built. It's the nature of this education game. But 80% of our teachers are asking that we don't return to person to in-person instruction because we don't feel safe. I know that there's a lot of conversation in the community about essential workers and the sacrifices that they have made due to this pandemic, and that's absolutely true. However, that is not the situation for teachers. While each school's specific plan differs on how we will meet guidelines, we know, we know this, we will be in the classrooms with students for extended hours. And while desks may be six feet apart, the reality of the situation is that masks will come off, kids will forget to put them on, kids will pull them down and, and cough outside of them, kids will walk to the pencil sharpener and forget their mask, and the list goes on. We all know this. All of this will be happening in classrooms with poor ventilation systems for extended amounts of time. Health officials have stated that there's a higher rate of spread after exposure of 10 minutes, and we will be in the room with students for hours. Our teachers at Madison, Madison Kindergarten Academy are in a building where none of those students will require, are required to wear masks. It's understandable that we're concerned. We asked on the survey how many of our teachers were at risk um, or lived with someone who was at risk of the 400 plus teachers who responded, 69%. That's 281 teachers are high risk or live with someone who is high risk. There have not been and perhaps can't be alternate options for these 281 teachers. And unfortunately, we've heard multi multiple responses from across the district with teachers who are concerned about their at-risk status that their options are to resign, retire, or return. Is this the message that we want coming from Madison County? Because I know that it's not representative of who we are as a district. But it's problematic that these are the options that some of our teachers have been told. As a member of this community, a mother of three children, all of whom attend our schools, I understand the frustrations, the fears, and concerns that we have. We all know that our kids need to be back in school. We know that the mental health impacts of this quarantine has had on all of us. And we want social interaction for our kids. But do you really know what you're asking our kids to walk back into? And let me brag for a minute about my principal. Um, I teach at Madison Central. And Brandon Fritz and our whole administrative team, has, they've just done an amazing job with our plans. Absolutely amazing. Creative problem solving solutions, it's been great. And they've figured out how to move mountains. And I'm proud that I have such a dedicated group of people leading me through this and leading our school through, school through this. But the problem is not something that they can change. Kids will be walking back into a world that is so incredibly structured and almost prison-like any health risk we take to meet the needs of the mental health toll will be null and void because this isn't anything like what they know. Kids won't be allowed to leave their assigned desks. They won't be allowed to interact with their friends like they normally would. No hugging, no hand holding, walking down the hallway in one direction and six feet apart, eating lunch in a classroom, and not being able to be close to your friends or to interact with friends who aren't in your class not being able to see the smiles of your friends' faces or high-five them, someone, or, or to even chat with your girlfriend at a locker. This isn't a normal situation, and this isn't going to be healthy for our students. So given the circumstances, given the fact that we are in a widespread scenario where contract tracing is ineffective, given the fact that EKU classes will be starting shortly, and it's inevitable that our case count will increase, and given the fact that our teachers who are the boots on the ground, who are the, where the rubber meets the road, and who always, always rise to every occasion that is asked of them, are saying that they overwhelmingly do not feel safe returning to in-person instruction. 
as the president of this organization of educators, we are asking that we begin the school year in a virtual learning environment until we begin to see numbers decline. It is our suggestion that we begin virtually for the first six weeks of school and reevaluate the situation at the October board meeting. It is imperative that a decision be made on this quickly, and Dr. Gillum is right. We are planners, and right now, your teachers are working nonstop and trying to figure out how to teach in a classroom that is socially distanced, how to develop group work activities, how to teach at learning centers that aren't allowed to have manipulatives, or how to have carpet time without carpet. Our energy is focused there, and while we do move mountains every day, we need time to focus and learn how to effectively do online instruction at all levels. That preparation time is essential because while we do know that we will be back in our classrooms at some point, and the preparation we're doing for that new world is important, it is inevitable that we will also be on an extended virtual learning this year. Whether we go back to school for a couple weeks, risk the spread, the infection, and the death of our students or our education professionals, and then decide to go virtual, or if we decide to begin virtually and work our way back into an in-person climate, either way, we will be virtual this year. The last question on our survey was asking if teachers felt prepared to teach effectively online. 61% of our teachers say they do, but they need more time and more training and resources to prepare. We are asking you for that time. We do not deliver, we do not want to deliver crisis mode instruction like we had to during the spring. Help us do our jobs effectively while keeping your students, your teachers, your education professionals, and your community safe. Thank you. Well, we thank you. Thank you for coming up and speaking with us, for all of your guidance. I know your leadership is very valuable to this organization, and we appreciate it very much. And I, I will speak for everyone. I'll let anyone speak that wants to, but I want to let you know that your safety and our teacher safety and our students is our utmost importance. And it is never forgotten. It thank is you. on the utmost top of our priority list. So please know that. Okay, thank you. Does anyone else want to speak? I know you're under no obligation to speak, but I want to make sure if anyone has questions or would like to address it. We know it's a complicated decision. We know that, and yes. we appreciate the the conversation around it and like Dr. Gillum and I have had a very we appreciate him speaking at our forum the other day and you know it's it's been a good thing we just are anxious and scared and nervous so thank you for your time thank you mm -hmm. all right moving on on our agenda to number four to approve the revised BG1 hi hello Welcome, Mr. Thomas. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll comment on the next two agenda items since they're so related. Um, uh, last Thursday, July 30th at 2 p.m., um, open six bids for the new Richmond Area Technology Center, Career Technology Center. Um, and fortunately, we had good competitive bids, and the low bids were even under the budget, um, as you all are aware of. Um, and Rising Sun was the the lowest bid. Um, we did some references because we're not aware of Rising Sun working for the district before, so uh, turned out there were people in the room, some, some of our design consultants that had worked with them before, um, some of their subs, I think Mr. Woods and others were aware of them. Um, I subsequently made phone calls to other architects, other districts, Pike County, Murphy Gray's architects, um, and just got glowing references really. And, received some information from them so um, I feel comfortable that they're certainly qualified to do the work um, and of course they had their bond and they're able to produce their bond so on the next agenda item of course we will be recommending that you do award that but uh, their bid plus the alternates there was a base bid of course which was the majority of the work uh, there were uh, alternate number um, one was the right-of-way work which you have to accept it's just a way to break out the money so that you can get reimbursed later um, alternate number two um, is train, HVAC controls, uh, your district lights train. Um, so if there were a different amount, um, you could choose to either take, pay that amount um, or not. But turns out train is in the base bid anyway, so you may say, well, why do we accept the alternate? 
you want to accept the alternate because it defines certain criteria that the contractor is going to have to stick to so they don't come back in the middle of the project and say, well, let's, let's switch up. No, we're accepting the alternate, the alternate even though it's a zero dollar alternate. Um, so that's alternate uh, number one and two. Number three is um, the, no, so it's not trained. Uh, that was, it was the Line X flooring. We did a, a different type of flooring for the restrooms. Um, and it was actually a credit of $1,500, so we would recommend um, accepting that as well, I guess. Did that get installed? And, okay. Um, and then number four is HVAC equipment, uh, which again is zero dollar because trains listed in the bid anyway. So with all the, with the, uh, the base bid and the alternates accepted, um, the total was $17,134,300. So yay, that's a, that's a great number for you all. Um, that number transfers over to your BG1. Of course, Kentucky Department of Education requires that you do a post-bid revised BG1, and I'm assuming you have those documents in front of you, but basically, as you all are aware with the BG1, it identifies the total construction costs, the construction contingencies, the architect's fee, which is basically just a KDE fee guideline, uh, your fiscal agent fee, bond discounts, and some miscellaneous costs. Um, all the way down to the total of $19,697,794. Um, and then of course the funds available have to match that number exactly. And you can see most of it is SFP K bond sale. There's a little bit of reimbursement from the city because of that alternate number one number. That's the city reimbursement exactly matches that alternate number one number, um, which the funding would also be $19,697,000 thousand seven hundred ninety four dollars short of any questions on the BG1 I would recommend approval of the revised BG1 for the Richmond Area Technology Center. Any Robert. questions? Can you remind us again honey, how much this was under our original budgeted amount? Yeah, uh, the BG the BG1 and the BG both BG3s were seventeen million seven hundred thousand and we were estimating after a few things were added at the end about 18 million I think it's what I reported at the last yes, board meeting. 17 so that's good and of course that that number has reciprocating you know there's there's fees on top of that and all, all that even you know kind of gets more fees on top of it but it's not that's 900,000 say plus the fees on top of that. any other questions all right, then I need a motion to approve the revised BG1 <coughs> for the Richmond Area Technology Center as presented. So moved. Motion's been made by Mrs. Brock. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Coyle. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, motion carries. Moving on to our agenda number five. To approve the bid and award the contract for the new Richmond ATC. So discussed most of that already. Um, as you see, we had six good bids there. Um, I think everybody was really happy in the room that day. <laughs> um, you were there. You saw how, how excited everybody was that our numbers came in so good. And um, again, we did the reference check and everything turned out really good. Um, all the bid documents were in compliance, so with that, we would recommend Rising Sun development um, in the amount of uh, <coughs> base bid and all four alternates for the total amount of $17,134,300. Any questions? All right, then I need a motion to award the bid for the new Madison County Area Technology Center to Rising Sun Developing Company, including base bid and alternates, one, two, three, and four for the total contract amount of $17,134,300. So moved. Motion's been made by Mr. Rutherford. Is there a second? I'll second. Second by Mrs. Cobb. All those in favor, say aye, please. Aye. aye. Any opposition? <clears throat> All right, motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Moving on to number six on our agenda. Adopt the resolution authorizing the insurance of bonds. And our speaker, he's not here, right? So, you know, all we have to do is uh, you have that, should have that, um, that resolution right there. Yes, would you just like for me to read it? So. You want me to read it or Mr. Woods? That's the, uh, uh, 
Well, I will be glad to because I have it right in front of me. Oh, okay. So I'll read this resolution <laughs> and then uh, we can go. Resolution of the Board of Education of the Madison County School District authorizing and approving the execution of lease agreement with the Madison County School District Finance Corporation and any further necessary instruments, approving certain architects' plans for the construction of certain school building projects, approving the execution of continuing disclosure and tax compliance procedures, and approving the plan of financing uh, the plan of financing the cost of said project. So this would be again to authorize the the uh, bond sale for those uh, for those bonds. And for anyone that does is not aware, we do have to act as two different agents. As a fiscal agent, we uh, we have our we had our board meeting at 4:50 there for the finance corporation. So. Summon. <laughs> Second. <laughs> All right, so the motion's been made to adopt the resolution authorizing the Madison County School District Finance Corporation to issue revenue bonds. The motion's been made by Mrs. Brock and the second by Mrs. Cobb, right? All right, all those in favor, say aye, please. Aye. aye. Any opposition? All right, motion carries. That was fun. I'm the only one that laughed, but that was fun. Okay, presentation of return to school plan. I think we're all very excited. All right. This. I mean, we've seen it, but I know that a lot of people are yes. very so, excited. Uh, so I'll just give you the highlights when I mean, you guys have had an opportunity to, to see uh, uh, multiple pieces of this. So uh, I guess the first thing I would say is that as soon as we started to wind down the 1920 uh, school year, um, the question I started getting around uh, the middle or end of April was, uh, you know, when are we going to open for uh, 2021? So. Uh, and, and asking questions around those plans. So, yeah, we've actually been planning for the reopening piece uh, since we did dismiss back in uh, back in the spring. Specifically, the plan that uh, that you have is uh, uh, we began the pre. No, I, I'm going to tell you just a little bit about how we kind of um, um, developed this piece. We began the uh, pre-planning information gathering stages back at, uh, at the end of May, early June. Uh, we were one of the first districts in the state to send out a, a community-wide survey that included parents and uh, and all stakeholders in our community. We we gathered that information and brought it back, and it gave us a, an initial piece on how we can can move forward. Uh, as well, we assembled a return to school advisory panel, which includes parents, uh, some community members, parents, and uh, and some uh, teachers, and as well as school district administrators uh, and school principals. Uh, and we also put together a uh, return to school transition team, which is made up primarily of our directors uh, throughout the district because there's so many op uh, operations and, and other um, independent programs um, uh, that we have to, uh, to plan around. For example, a preschool program or special ed program and some of those. So um, we did that. Uh, again, we started on that uh, at the uh, as summer started, and particularly, I think that that first survey went out right at the first of June. So uh, then we began our based off of that information, we began our phase one planning, which was announcing our learning models, which we did uh, there about the uh, um, well early on in um, um, in July. I think we released our uh, communication out to our parents and um, uh, asked them to. Uh, let us know our questionnaire for so they could um, they could uh, we could collect their student or parent choice for which uh, learning model that they wanted to do and then we uh, we had to combine that and actually find out exactly how many students we were going to uh, to have on each uh, on each model our numbers turned out to be very similar to what we had anticipated uh, every piece of data going into this told us that it was around 70 percent of our students would uh, would return that's been statewide averages uh, that was in our that uh, that information is what we got back from our initial survey that we did to community members and then it was supported as uh, as we actually asked students to put their name uh, identify their name in school and what grade they're going to be in and which uh, which one of those models they wanted to about 70 percent uh want uh requested in-person instruction uh and then we we had two models for um for our distance learning, one is an independent uh, distance learning and one is an interactive uh, distance learning. Those were split about equally, about 15% for each of those models. Uh, so based off of that information, we were then ready to go into what we would consider phase two planning, which is um, starting to develop, knowing the number of students we had, development of our online delivery plan, how we were going to deliver that uh, distance learning, uh, as well as a startup plan 
uh, looking at our operations, knowing how many students we were going to have, what uh, specifically what's that going to look like on school buses and and uh, just logistics on a on a school campus. Um, and then we also um, uh, started looking at possible contingency plans, and you'll see those in the plan. Uh, a plan to uh, to operate under reduced capacity if for some reason we were uh, required to operate under reduced capacity. Um, so we felt like we could plan around a 50% of our in-person students, um, develop a model around that. That would get us, um, that would work for us if we, uh, if the uh, if the state issued a, um, a requirement that we were to only have 50% of our building capacity. It would also work if they told us that we had to operate under uh, one third of our building capacity as well, because um, you know, we've, we've done a 50-50 split but realize that's 50-50 out of only 70% of our students to start with, and we already have some additional space in, in most, of our, most of our schools, so we would be able to uh, accommodate under that plan. Uh, we also developed, um, started developing models for district-wide closures, and then uh, school by school uh, at grade level, partial closures if, uh, if it were needed. Uh, so those were the big pieces that we started to chunk out in phase two, and then phase three planning, um, we actually got in and, and, uh, and specifically drew off of those previous plans, plans for intermittent closures, uh, which we, you know, we certainly want to be prepared for that. We're hoping that that doesn't happen, but, uh, but we also know that uh, we can see spikes from time to time and, and little things could come up, so we plan for intermittent closures. And then uh, the phase three was, uh, uh, as well, our individual school plans. Okay? Um, our schools uh, uh, submitted those based off the parameters that we gave them as a district and, and based off of the numbers of students that they have in the building, they, um, they were able to design their individual school plans. Uh, and then the, the last phase of that is to submit the plan itself for, to the board for final approval. So, um, so that was a little bit about getting here. I will just give you kind of the executive summary of this and, and hit the highlights and then see what questions you have. I mean, uh, um, you know, the entire plan is about a 20 some page document so uh, i was getting ready to say can yeah. you really so hit the I'm, highlights because it's I, 20 pages yeah it's so i'm not uh, i'm gonna hit the highlights i'm not gonna read the whole thing and and there is also uh, yeah it, there's also a, a high degree of redundancy and a lot of the stuff that we see in that this plan we have seen in the guidance coming from the state department because everything within our plan on our guidance pieces have been built off of uh, the uh, information we received from the governor's office, the Department of Public Health, and local health officials. Uh, and then we also make references to some of the pieces uh, that CDC, the uh, uh, Center for Disease Control, has, uh, has made certain resources available to us. But our primary go-to, uh, just to make sure that everyone is very clear on this, our primary go-to is uh, the State Department of Public Health. Okay? Um, and um, as well, I will, I will essentially kind of lay this out, and I don't want to speak for our health officials, but um, essentially kind of the chain of command, the CDC pulls stuff together nationally, and then they send that out to the states, and then it's funneled, funneled through the Department of Public Health, and then each state, based on local data and, and local uh, situations, they react to that, and they issue guidance based off of that. So, uh, so we are listening to the CDC, but it's filtered through Department of Public Health, okay? Uh, but we did reference specific documents from CDC in our um, in our plan because those were specific guidance pieces that the Department of Public Health pointed us toward. For example, the, the uh, recommendations on face masks, the the types of face masks to use. Um, there's a description in there, and the CDC has issued that. And the Department of Public Health didn't rewrite those those uh, guidelines or recommendations. They just copied that. So that's an example of of how we would reference directly to the CDC. All right, so with all of that being said, uh, our plan basically revolves around three, first of all, three learning options. That would be the in-person, uh, the interactive distance learning, and the independent distance learning. Uh, we did give parents a choice on that, and we allowed them to uh, select which one that they would, they would want to, uh, to, to, uh, to have their child uh, start out on. We also gave parents an opportunity to uh, change that. Um, we are allowing them to change um, we're, we're permitting change prior to the opening day of school. Uh, we ask that they do that prior to our, our uh, schools getting their um, uh, rosters kind of solidified, which, uh, which we gave them uh, the date of uh, August the 12th. So that's the first day that teachers would come in. And I would also point out, 
another piece that, that we did as a district just to make sure that I'm, I mention it and remind everyone as we did uh, push back our, our start date uh, as well in response to this already. So, you know, we were, uh, we were planning on doing the 10th for teachers and then students come in on the 12th and we, uh, we moved that to teachers coming in on the 12th delaying the student entry to the 26th and giving uh, teachers those 10 days to uh, to work and to plan and to uh, to work together and and uh, do some training and there's been a heavy emphasis in in our dialogue with principals around teacher involvement teacher voice and what those training pieces look like and uh, and the work that they will be doing uh, it's uh, uh, I was we, we've been very adamant that this is not 10 days of training uh, our people need to get ready and so uh, we want to uh, to give them as much time as possible to do that, realizing that there are some some days of, of training that will be necessary. Uh, so, uh, so we had those three learning options. Um, with that, parents uh, chose the uh, the learning option that they prefer for their child. Then the next piece I would highlight is that we have identified essentially four different situations. Uh, that, that's our color coded page that's in there. We identified four different situations. Uh, under which we could operate and we color coded them as green yellow orange and red uh, green meaning all good uh, you know, if we were operating under green uh, the uh, COVID-19 would not be much of a consideration in our community okay we don't really anticipate operating under green this year we'd love to I'd love to uh, operate under green in about uh, two weeks but uh, we're probably not going to be there okay uh, then uh, the next level down would be the yellow and that's where we're making the most uh, most preparation for right now. Yeah, under the yellow um, uh, level, we would take our precautions uh, of social distancing and, and the other uh, safety precautions in place. Uh, we would have in-person uh, learning, and uh, all the as well as both of our distance learning options available under the yellow uh, situation. If um, if the um, numbers were high and uh, and or received. Uh, information from the from the state that requested that we reduce our capacity or for some reason we felt that we needed uh, for safety purposes to reduce capacity in our buildings we would operate under the orange uh, line and that orange line is uh, uh, it's it simply takes uh, if you look at those three learning options we have the M, uh, the um, the two distance models doesn't change them at all okay those are fixed throughout all levels Okay, and we do plan on offering both of those. Uh, we're, we are making a commitment to provide those for the entire year. So a student would not have to come off of one of those learning models mid-year. If they start out on an interactive virtual, they would have the opportunity to remain on interactive virtual all year. The same with distance, uh, uh, the distance, um, uh, independent distance learning. So uh, the only piece that changes under these situations would be the in-person. Uh, yellow everybody's here under the orange we split to an AB and that's uh, that's divided by the alphabet um, based off of that plan and students would attend two days a week and we would have work for them to do on those opposite days we divided by alphabet so that households would be um, consistent so that um, uh, well first of all we have it, we need to have some way to divide kids themselves not grade levels because dividing just grade levels uh, does not uh, reduce uh, the number of students in a classroom okay. if uh, if second grade is only coming uh, two days a week you have all your second graders still there on those two days so uh, by dividing uh, alphabetically we divide our uh, classrooms in half and would reduce that capacity um, and as well doing that by uh, by the last names uh, sometimes in some of our households if parents if students were re required to stay at home um, on those on those days that they would not be in person some of our families some of our households depend on the older children uh, for child care for their uh, for their younger children if they have a high school student and a um, say a um, an elementary student they would uh, sometimes they depend on them to uh, to stay home and watch the kids so uh, by splitting those that would uh, that would make sure that each household households would attend all together um, then um, so that's our orange situation and then the uh, the the other uh, level would be a red uh, the red level red situation and that is where we would not be in person at all we would be uh, all virtual under that model um, our two distance learning options independent and interactive continue on as they've always been the uh, difference would come with our in person and what we would do as a contingency piece is we will ask those uh, students to uh, identify their contingency model up front 
and let us know if we have to go virtual, whether they would prefer to go in person, or not in person, but uh, if they would prefer to go uh, interactive or, or uh, independent, they would make that choice. And then if we need to go all virtual, we would, uh, we would immediately flip and, and be able to do that. So uh, now, and when I say immediately flip, it's possible to do that, you know, by flipping a switch, but not preferred. I mean, we would, you know, we certainly want to give folks uh, a time for that and time to prepare on that. And, and uh, not only our teachers, but also our, our uh, families as well. So, um, all right. So those were our, uh, I guess, our four situations. We have three learning options, four situations, and then we developed three contingency plans, which I've essentially kind of mentioned two of those. Uh, which would be that A-B contingency plan and then an also an all virtual uh, contingency plan. Uh, our other contingency plan is one that, that um, uh, we're, we've been familiar with for several years and that's our NTI contingency plan. And uh, we had some conversations in the advisory group about changing the name of that. Um, and uh, we bannered it around a little bit and then we had some more uh, com uh, conversation around it at the uh, at the district because nti the the everyone's idea of nti changed uh, on march probably didn't change on march 16th last year that's when we went to it it probably took about a week or so before everybody's uh, uh, idea of nti really really changed so uh but that would be for for short-term intermittent closures we're talking about very brief closures uh uh you know two or three, four or five days, we would not, uh, if we had to close a school, if we had a, a couple of cases and we needed to time to stop, let's check everything out. Let's see what we need to do uh, before we bring students back in, uh, students and staff back into the building. Uh, we would not immediately go to an all virtual piece. You know, we wouldn't move everyone to either the, one of the distance learning pieces. We would just simply do what we've always known as NTI or we knew before March of last year which are those short-term assignments and, and programs and work that we would post. And we have all of our, our uh, parameters around the NTI. We would just convert to NTI for a few days on those short-term intermittent closures and then return to in-person. Uh, and if we were not able to return to in-person, we're gonna be on for an extended period of time, we would move to, uh, to the all virtual contingency plan, essentially is how that would work. Uh, so that's those three contingency plans that we built around uh, and then We've uh, we built a significant number of, of safety precautions in the whole piece. Um, you know, the, the screenings are going to be a big part of that. Screenings and social distancing, and then our uh, providing our uh, PPE of, of some type with, with that being the masks. And uh, um, um, again, with the screening, um, the screening piece, placing signage throughout our buildings and everything. Uh, one of the one of the uh, the things, actually I got that, I received on May the 1st, uh, a very detailed plan from Toyota. Toyota, uh, you know, took a few days out and then they returned. Um, I, I received Toyota's plan on May the 1st and, and, you know, we've looked through that and used that to kind of guide us with some of the, some of the pieces. But, but honestly, yeah, in looking through that, we looked at kind of how, how they've done some things, but honestly, the information there and also the information that we've received for the last you know maybe there was some confusion around it the first couple of months but for the last two to three months folks it's social distancing it's wear the mask it's wash your hands and uh, those are those are the main things and uh, and so all of those pieces are in place the uh, temperature screenings you know we will temperature screen every student we have uh, 500 um, we have 500 uh, thermal scan thermometers for our district. So uh, and you kind of space that out every school will have 20 plus, okay, uh, of those because we are going to have to do that as students, as people enter the building, not just students, but staff as well. And so we need to be able to spread out uh, throughout and, uh, and uh, we have a few extras there for uh, in, the, in the event that uh, the batteries go down. And uh, so we wanna make sure everything is, everything is good with that. So. That's kind of the, the Reader's Digest version of the plan. Uh, I would entertain any questions there that, uh, that any of the board might have. I have one question. Mm -hmm. Back on your ABC plan, contingency yes. plan, um, you said the houses will be divided by the kids' last names. Mm -hmm. What about a household that has two, a child with two yes. different names? Opposite last names. Okay. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it'll be A through K and then L through Z. So. 
Uh, so, you know, it would have to be a situation where students would fall in either of those groups. If that happens, I've asked their principals to work with those families mm -hmm. and, and basically just land on, on a day for that family. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're not going to be hard and fast on that. But, uh, so this information, Dr. Gillen, will go mm -hmm. out to our families tomorrow, the next day, sometime this week? If the, our, uh, we have built a, uh, a web page with all of this information and all the buttons on it. And uh, I know you guys have, have had an opportunity to see that in the beta version, but uh, our plan is to release that, um, uh, go live with that web page tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we want a little bit of time in the morning just to double check everything and make sure because you know, this was this was quite a bit of stuff and and uh, um, when you one of the one of the things about pulling all this together is involving a lot of people involving uh, and their our principals and our directors and our principals have involved teachers back at schools and and all of uh, and and had the conversations among themselves and and uh, uh, you know, teacher teams and uh, uh, and then all of our different departments across the district. There's a whole lot of people we have to talk to every time we make any type of decision. So, and it, uh, so, we uh, I need to, a little bit of time tomorrow. First of all, I wanted to make sure that uh, if there was anything that we uh, that the board had questions on, or or that we needed to reconsider, or that you wanted to, if you wanted to pull something out of the plan, or or whatever, uh, we'd be able to do that, and as well review that uh, web page. But our, our intent is to have it go live at, at uh, around 4 p.m. tomorrow. So what is the process for a teacher who um, is at risk? I know we have teachers that have underlying health issues. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been speaking with a teacher that has multiple sclerosis. So mm -hmm. what is the process for those teachers? Do they go to their principals? Do they go to HR? Yeah. Kinda okay. Uh, well, I mean, it's, it, a lot of that's going to be situational, obviously. But the, uh, the first thing that we would want them to do is talk with their principal. Okay. And uh, and share their concerns and kind of talk through that. Um, we do have a, a couple of options. One of the pieces that we did, and I'm going to talk more about it here after the after we do the plan piece, is the uh, the opportunity for uh, we had some virtual teachers that would um, uh, that would present that that would manage those so that essentially that interactive distance learning piece. Uh, so. We do have a few positions that might be possible for those individuals that are that are concerned, uh, but it, they would need to work with their principal on talking about that. We have what we uh, what I'm hoping to be able to do with that is take that group of of uh, uh, teachers and spread them out at each of our schools so that every school has a couple of those folks and then they all work together as a team. Um, to provide that uh, to provide that instruction they're all assigned uh, and we're going to assign them all a, a specific grade level so they know specifically what they're supposed to be doing and it's going to synergize our efforts across the district with being able to, to pinpoint in and focus on that but uh, so that's an opportunity okay so that's just but that's just one opportunity um, um, and you know, I don't know how many our principals have uh, have met with teachers and they've talked with them and uh, some some people some folks have expressed that desire uh, there may be some that uh, that have not expressed that desire yet uh, as of earlier today most uh, all of the ones that had meetings with uh, with all of our principals and most of the ones who had um, the folks that had requested something like that uh, requested uh, to teach virtual uh, it appeared as though our principals were going to be able to accommodate those with some of those positions, um, but there may be folks out there that 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 haven't. I'm not going to I'm not going to guarantee that at all. But as of today, I got no responses from principals that indicated that there were people who had requested that that were not be, going to be able to accommodate. But if numbers got real large on that, then certainly that is a possibility. Um, all right. So beyond that, there are um, uh, you know we do have uh, well. Other than that, I would encourage them to talk with their principals as well to see if there are other accommodations. There might be certain parts of the day that they're concerned about. You know, is there a way to work around that? But if uh, but if someone is just completely concerned about being in a building with uh, with other people, then uh, you know, then our there are options. Unfortunately, are you know are quite limited. Uh, there's not a whole lot we can do. But then at that point, we would talk with uh, they could talk with HR. There are a couple of of uh, options, leave options that are provided under the Families First uh, Coronavirus uh, Relief Act, I think. And uh, uh, there are a couple of options for that. There's also FMLA leave that is uh, could be a possibility. So um, you know, we will work with them the best we can. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have a, 
you know, an abundance of options, but we do have a few. Yeah. Um, going back to the masks, you said mm -hmm. there was a restriction on the type of mask that they recommend. Are we going to let the parents know this uh, online, or how are we going to get that? Yeah, our, our plan refers back to, uh, does refer back to that CDC guidance, and we're going to make sure that we get that out once we, once we get this. Uh, in fact, our, our uh, um, um, communications folks at the district started uh, started today with kind of a uh, wear a mask campaign mm -hmm. to uh, to get information out. We're going to continue that over the next month to make sure that we, we push that out. Uh, and essentially, the the uh, restrictions there's not very many restrictions on that. It, you know, it needs to it needs to come around the mouth and, and you know uh, fit around there and um, uh, and be two ply. Those are the main pieces but that CDC guidance is in there I've heard I've had some parents um, concerned that they've heard that the masks are going to have to follow under a dress code where they can't mm -hmm. have certain things on them is that something that's going on it well, says it in here yeah in our rules yeah uh, so dress code so here's what uh, here's what we have with that uh, you know our individual schools have their uh, have their dress codes mm -hmm. so uh, you know we would expect that the the um, the mask comply with whatever dress code uh, pieces that the uh, site-based councils would would put in place. I do not anticipate any of our um, um, schools doing anything uh, too uh, too intrusive on that. I think the main thing there is they're um, they're putting that they're making that notation so that uh, so that our folks understand that. Um, yeah, there's certain things that could be inappropriate mm -hmm. uh, images and so forth on those masks that yeah. they uh, that they want to yeah. control. I mm -hmm. think that's what they're after. Yeah, the I can see question. inappropriate. I just yes. don't want the images families to be burdened yeah. with having yeah. to go out and hunt a specific type with yes. not any kind of yeah. marking and, on it at all. And sometimes we use the word dress code. We think of the uh, we 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 think it's. Um, yeah, every school has a dress code, but, but frequently people talk about just our middle schools having that dress code. Our middle schools have a uniform dress code, uh, but everyone has a dress code. So, um, so when we talk about that, we that's essentially what we're talking about that that it would fall under their their dress code for appropriateness and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, I do not believe that there's any um, um, any. I'm not aware of a school that is looking at putting specific restrictions around. You can only have this type and this type and this type, or the only uh, mask you can have is uh, one that's purchased through our online store right. or something like that. Um, uh, I'm not aware of that. Okay. If, if it is, that I will, uh, I'd like to know it. I'd appreciate somebody telling me that if there is a school and talk to that principal, but that, it, that would be a site-based council uh, decision. Mm -hmm. so. I think what you've seen are PTOs and things mm -hmm. like that offering these masks as a fundraiser. Sure, yeah. But it's not a requirement. Not a requirement. I, I think yeah. the only requirement is the two ply, and, yeah. um, and you know, nothing appropriate. And mm -hmm. I, I think we all know what inappropriate. Yeah. Well, would we be. just don't yeah. want it to get down to like he said at right. the end, is where they're requiring them to wear a certain mask that they're making right. money off of. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that yeah. shouldn't. And be I don't think that I haven't seen that. Yeah, yeah. I, I would hope not. I just I, you know we. There's a purpose behind this mask, and if we can get people to, you know, uh, work with us on that, I think we'll be very pleased. Okay. And, uh, I don't want to get too restricted. So I know we discussed this because I, I, we had a conversation this morning, um, and I just want to kind of go back through it in my mm -hmm. mind. If we have a student um, in a classroom test positive, I've had mm -hmm. parents ask me if we will be notifying them, but if I'm correct, we will be talking to the health department. They will have the contact tracers. They will be doing all that contacting after they assess the risk of exposures. We're not allowed because of FERPA and HIPAA to let to divulge any of that information to protect our students. Will we have an assurance from our health department and the Kentucky Department of Public Health that we are going to have enough contact tracers? Um. I know that's hard for you to answer, but, yeah. but it, they have know. not provided me with that assurance, uh -huh. but, um, uh, but we also have to, um, you know, we have to look at numbers. There have been a substantial number of contact tracers that have been, that have been, uh, um, deployed throughout our, throughout our state. 
Well, I know the governor just spoke of it yeah. a couple of days ago and, yeah. and was reassuring and saying that there had been so many hired and, yes. you know, so forth. Yeah. So it, They run into a little bit of a backlog because they had to go through the training piece, and as they were training, numbers went up, and, and so when they hit right. the ground running, they were already behind. But, uh, um, but certainly, uh, you know, certainly if we, uh, if the, the, uh, the health department is more than willing to work with us and, and uh, uh, communicate with us uh, at, to, to the degree that they can, you know. The, uh, um, Do you know if our school nurses will be involved in that process at all? Our school nurses have typically been involved in contact tracing, and what we're going to do prior to the, um, prior to the opening of schools is uh, actually the next week or two, um, we are going to sit down with the, uh, with the health department and talk specifically about how they, our plan, as you can see it, uh, you know, we have in all of our school plans, we have the manifest, we have the, uh, um, uh, we have the uh, seating charts and, and all of those pieces in place. So that information is there. We have to have some good conversation with our health department about how do they want that information and when will they want it and how do they actually communicate with us to get that information. It's, it's all there and it's all in our plan to get it, but then, but that communication piece that still has to be uh, specified. So, um, and so we're going to do that. So if, so just back to your, your statement, yes, if a student has a, uh, if anyone, um, school or not school, uh, sure. if, they, uh, if they test positive, that, that positive test is referred to the health department and then the contact tracer takes that and then goes through their contact tracing part. Um, they, uh, they, because of right, uh, you know, their, the, the privacy uh, regulations around uh, uh, health information, they do not disclose the name of the individual or anything else. But uh, our involvement, we are going to know if there is any exposure, any chance of exposure, because they're going to contact us and want that information, those pieces of information. They're going to want our, our uh, rosters, our, our manifests, our seating charts, and all of that, uh, that information. When that happens, we will know that we will have had an exposure. And that includes seating charts for buses as well. Yes. That yes. was something that I, yes. that was very. I, mm -hmm. I was very impressed with the transportation plan. Yeah. I felt like it it assured as best as possible to try to mm -hmm. keep students safe. Yes. The loading from the back, emptying from the front, seating charts, and so <coughs> we know where every student is at all times. Yeah. Um, okay. Can I ask a question yeah. in relation sure. to the buses? Mm -hmm. Our students. Who will be cleaning the buses? Is it? I know we have a maintenance staff to, to help with our school systems and, and our buildings, but what about the buses? And, and will they be taking attendance every day? Like, how will we know if, like, on Thursday, someone was sick and they weren't there that day? Yeah. All right. So, uh, yes, our bus drivers will be doing that. Now, they won't uh, uh, be a little different. You know, the, each bus driver will kind of figure out the best way to do it, but. Uh, uh, but the way we kind of have tentatively planned is when the bus pulls into the to the school to unload before they unload it's going to be different yeah. uh, it's going to be different than what we typically think of and usually if you think of a bus pulling into a school to unload kids as soon as it as soon as you hear those air brakes pop everybody's up and everybody's kind of screaming it's not going to be the way it works you know our, our students are going to be instructed to stay seated until and then and so this person will get up and, and get off, and it'll take you know take a, a little bit longer, but it shouldn't take that much longer because you know how people are; they usually get piled up and they they get uh, log jam there. Uh, but anyway, that's the the piece. And while that's happening, the bus driver will make sure that they you know they check off and they can remember who they picked up and, and who they didn't. And as well, um, you know, we're only uh, um, it, our transfer our buses will not be as loaded as they typically are because you know, only 70% of our students are, are uh, going to be attending in person. And as we look at that across the district, that is pretty, has been pretty evenly distributed grade to grade, level to level, uh, across the board. So, uh, so it's going to be the same as those who uh, are very similar for those that, uh, that otherwise would have ridden buses. So our bus capacity initially is going to be down around 70% because down to about 70% of what it typically is. And then it's going to be even lower because there's going to be some parents, uh, one of the pieces that we ask on our, um, uh, on our back to school questionnaire there was, you know, do you need transportation or do you not? And we saw a little bit of an increase in parents saying that they would bring their own child to school. So 
Uh, so we're going to be down just uh, probably around 50 to 60, 55 to 60 percent of our typical bus capacity. So it's going to be a little, you know, it's going to be fewer anyway. And as well, we have um, uh, we've eliminated as much as possible our shuttle routes, so that uh, so that that will um, um, reduce those. That's that's where we usually see big numbers on bus. Okay? It's, it's not the route that goes out and picks everybody up, you know, because they're going out into all different areas of the county. And when they get back to school, then uh, kids off of four or five buses get off and load this bus to go to the middle school or the high school. And that's where we really pack kids on. Uh, we're not doing that. We've eliminated those, uh, those shuttle routes. And we've not eliminated every shuttle route, but we have it at our high schools and middle schools. We have a, have a couple that just simply we couldn't, but they're... We're not anticipating that they'd be that they're they're going to be heavily um, um, uh, populated anyway, but uh, those buses are going to swing back around and and drop. They're going to drop the elementary off. They're going to swing back around, and drop the uh, the high school or middle school off at their uh, at their schools. So, uh, Mr. Lakes has it all worked out. We've gone over it. A meeting in the morning with principals to specifically look at their bus times to make sure that all of that is synced, and uh, it seems to it seems to work. So. That part of it will not be as uh, uh, as critical. It also helps us with with the um, uh, with the cleaning piece, okay? Because the students who you know students get on in the morning, they get off. We don't we don't have to clear that bus out and then take another group of students and sitting in the same seat that another kid was just sitting in. So that eliminates that need to clean that that seat right then prior to those shuttle routes. So what we are going to do, um, we've worked, I know Mr. Cash, he's back there right now. We had the uh, rep from, uh, that, that sells the, uh, the Virex product, which is one of our uh, uh, disinfectants and sanitizing uh, products that we use um, on our, on our, uh, uh, throughout our district. But he had them in today to look at that. So they're, they're working through some uh, specific pieces on that. But yes, we will be disinfecting those at the end of um, when students get off before the next group gets on. Yes. And I noticed in there too, you know, they're going to be required to put the hand sanitizer on when they get mm -hmm. on. Yes. Um, we've kind of been back and forth on the temperature checks for the bus riders. Are we yeah. doing that on the bus or are we going to do that when we get them to school? We're going to do that when we get to school. We're going to ask that they, uh, we're going to ask that parents who are transporting their children sign the, uh, the agreement that was um, Kentucky Department of Education sent it out. It's basically, uh, uh, I agreed to do a self-check before I send my child to the bus. And uh, so we're going to ask that they do that and actually follow through with that. Um, but, you know, in looking at that, um, I mentioned to before what, what that would require because of transportation regulations. Our drivers could not do that, um, do that um, temperature check. That would require a bus monitor on every bus. And our ability to staff those um, and staff them consistently would be very, very, very challenging. And uh, and as well, um, the gain from that uh, it would be very challenging to staff. It would be a big expense, and the gain from that would be minimal. And I say minimal because if we're asking parents to screen, uh, then we are very rarely. Very rarely would we probably screen a kid with a temperature check and not allow them on the bus the, uh, because the guidelines are an actual fever, not just an increased temperature. So it, it would have to be 100.5 or above. Uh, so you're talking about just a very, uh, uh, the student could still have a, a very, I won't say a fever, but a low grade uh, increase in temperature could, uh, would still be allowed on the bus with that. So. Uh, so our screening piece would not eliminate very many, and um, I mean we're going to trust that our parents will do that, and those that would um, not screen their child and try to send them through, and, and just being a practical uh, um, piece of information here, they would likely give them Tylenol, which would be a fever reducer anyway, which would then make it possible that that child could ride the bus if they if someone's wanting to get away with it. I so. guess. Well, okay, they got on the bus and you mm -hmm. gave us a real good visual of, of that step. Now they getting off the bus or they're getting out of the parents' car? What's the next step? Are they going in the same doors? They got specific doors, getting temperature taken in? Yeah. 
Give us a little detail. Okay, every school has an individual plan based on the you know the logistics of where their buses unload and where their um, where their parent drop offs are. But we will have uh, uh, we will have multiple points of entry, and at those multiple points of entry, we will have every school will have staff out there with the uh, the hand the monitors that will scan the children before they and any uh, as well as staff before they go into the building. Mm -hmm. And the other doors will be locked and mm -hmm. employees yes. will be told not to use those mm -hmm. entrances? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about if a, a student refuses to put a mask on before they get on the bus? Uh, it's going to be a difficult situation to deal with. Yeah. And uh, yeah, bus transportation is, uh, is not something, bus transportation is, uh, is discretionary. It's not required. We're not required to provide bus transportation and we can restrict students from riding the bus. So um, my thought there is that we would work through that. We would work through that very quickly. The specific guidelines on that, if you have a student on a bus that is not masked, is to have them sit in the front in an isolated seat. That, that's the recommendation from the Kentucky Department of Education. Yeah. So, Are we going to have masks available in case a child loses their mask during the day or yes. it's not um, appropriate? Or Yes, I, and I actually had a list of, uh, of PPE and, and so forth that we'd already uh, purchased and, and uh, uh, available, and I had that up in my office, and I actually left it uh, um, up there and did not bring that down to you guys. But, yeah, we have 63,000 masks um, on hand right now, okay? and we can get more as we need it. As needed, uh, you know, obviously we don't want to spend taxpayer money on masks if we, you know, if people can bring their own. And uh, that's what we think, the, you know, it's what we're going to encourage. And we feel that the overwhelming majority of people are going to do that. But we will have masks available at, uh, at every location and on every school bus for individuals that may, um, that may just not have one with them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But we do, would like to ask that everybody try to provide their own. Absolutely. So we don't yes. have to spend that money. We don't want to have to spend that money. And if, you know, cheap. yeah, and if a, if a child comes a couple of times without one, you know, we'll have a conversation with that child, with that parent, and say, you know, please uh, uh, do your part. We'd appreciate it. Yeah. Can, can you tell us just real quick, because um, I know some of the teachers are kind of wondering what that two week before school starts looks like. What, mm -hmm. what can they kind of expect in terms of training and what's going to take place then yeah we have a uh, we have a few hours of some required trainings that we do every year those are uh, those are in the works there uh, and then beyond that we have left the majority of that time up to the individual principals in the individual buildings to work with their staff to say what trainings do you need where do you how do you uh, you know what what do we need to do as a um, as a uh, school to make sure that we're we're ready for this uh, now, obviously, safety trainings and, and protocols will be a part of that, but uh, out of that two weeks, that will not be an extensive part of it. You know, just a, a, uh, um, you know, a few hours there to, to make sure they understand all those safety protocols. Other than that, it's up to the individual, um, um, individual schools and principals to plan that piece. Um, we have, as a district, at the district level, we have pulled away from some of our district initiatives. Uh, you know, we've kind of put some of those pieces on pause. Uh, you know, this is the time where we would do continued training on you know, CCI and, um, and uh, some of those other pieces. But we've uh, we put that on hold for right now, realizing that the, the, the things that our teachers need are uh, um, uh, a little different. They need to be able to get ready for school and as well uh, prepare, for, uh, you know, prepare for whatever um, you know, extended online uh, types of pieces that, that might, might be needed because even if um, you know, even being in person, there's that possibility of getting pulled back in, or um, as well, they will have some, you know, 30% of our students are going to be uh, in utilizing some type of distance learning. So uh, we want everyone prepared, uh, prepared for that. And then in terms of the back to school nights and the jump starts and all that kind of stuff that everybody's used to, mm -hmm. um, and I know that's gonna look different in each, in each building. But in general, what can parents expect with that? Well, here's what our, here's what our principals have said uh, today when I talked with them. Uh, no one is planning a, you know, we typically have the, it's back to school night, six to nine at, you know, whatever elementary. Uh, that's not happening. Uh, what, uh, what is happening, it depends from school to school. 
Uh, some are doing a drive-by uh, piece, okay? Uh, so if they're doing a drive-by, kind of a meet and greet type thing, and then they're doing a virtual or an online um, orientation with their teacher, uh, that's one model. Uh, other schools, some schools are doing uh, breaking it down into grade levels and, and dividing it out and doing it over multiple nights. So, um, so one night might be um, you know, Mrs. Jones's uh, you know, third grade class and uh, uh, students A through K come from six to seven and, and L through Z from you know, seven to eight or whatever. So those, they're breaking that up. Will those plans be on um, what's going live tomorrow on the individual school plans those, or are those not finalized? That, that's not finalized yet. Uh, schools are going to communicate that out. And, and what I've asked principals specifically to do with their, with their school plans, uh, we've identified about seven different areas that uh, really need some good explanation to parents. And, uh, and we've asked them to do a short little video uh, segment on each of those. So, uh, for example, um, uh, morning procedures. So, what's it going to look like when you arrive at school? If you're if you're if you're doing a parent drop off, you know, if you're bringing your child to school, they would actually get out in the parking lot and video. Here, you're going to come around through here. You're going to stop right here. You're going to drop your kid off. They're going to walk over here. We're going to scan them with the uh, thermal scan thermometer. Then they'll go through the door and that type of thing. So, they're going to do a, a series of video pieces with that. To, uh, to make sure we appropriately communicate with parents. And that'll be coming out very soon. You know, our teachers come on the 12th, but um, we do have a little bit of time with our, you know, our actual uh, you know, students coming back because that's not until the 26th, so that's a little over three weeks. Yeah. But, but, but our principals are planning all, all around that right now. Yeah. How about all of our safety drills, like mm -hmm. our tornado or fire drills and yeah. all of our safety yeah, the states Probably issued course. guidance on that, and what they're what they've um, told us to do is basically do them classroom by classroom. So, you, you're familiar with the old tornado drill where everybody in school goes out in the hallway right. and hunkers down in front of the lockers and piles right next to each other. Do that. Well, we're not doing that, right. but we will do still do the tornado drill, uh, and we'll do it class by class. Each class will go out so the students know what to do uh, when they they'll get down into position. But they will be, you know, we'll ask them to social distance. So. Okay. The students will do that. Uh, we'll still do the fire drills, class by class. Um, so, all of those all those drills will still occur. And you mentioned the lockers. Um, just kind of a heads up, we're not using lockers right now. Uh, our okay. intention right now is not to use lockers, and we will talk more with uh, with the individual schools around those plans as we as we get there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there more questions? We're firing them at you. That's fine. Thank you. Keep them going. How many yeah. students are we going to have an area? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, yeah. fine. An area where they're going to um, designate as a place for the students to go if there's some kind of indication that they might be sick or something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Tell us more about where what's going on in that. All right. Yeah, we uh, we were we're going to designate a safe, uh, I guess, kind of a quarantine room off of the uh, and, and every school is is identifying where that location will be um, you know typically if a, if a child gets sick they go down to the nurse's office and uh, and we go from there but if a child is uh, exhibiting you know uh, COVID-19 symptoms we will when they get down there we will isolate them and then um, every school will have a different location it will depend on, on where they are but every school will have a designated place to put those children mm -hmm. and uh, let them sit while we wait on parents to come and, and pick them up right. and there'll be a specific person working those rooms uh, yeah well it's gonna be a school nurse and that is that is one thing that we have uh, done in regard to the plan is uh, um, is adding a uh, and that's that's actually going to be I think it's on our, our agenda for the 13th uh, I didn't want to crowd this one too much I want to make sure we we stayed right around the, the plan itself, but um, to approve an additional school nurse position for this coming year to make sure that we have a dedicated nurse at each school. Um, every school's had a nurse, but we've had to rotate a few around. Uh, but for this for this school year, we want to add a nurse so that each school has a nurse and it's only one nurse and it's the same nurse every day. Yeah. Yeah. So I thought it was interesting. I don't know if it was the Department of Public Health or the CDC actually changed the guidelines yesterday 
about if a student exhibited, it had, now they've changed the language, it has to be a new cough, not mm -hmm. a cough that they've <coughs> had. So it's like an every day they're changing. They changed, if they had tested positive but they were symptom free, it was from seven to 10 day quarantine. I mean, mm -hmm. they changed it from 10 to seven. So and it it's, was 14. Yeah, and it's such a fluid situation. I mean, it's literally every day that things are changing. So I commend your team for really trying to, to bend and be flexible. And we know, I know that, that we're gonna do the same, yeah. you know. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that, and yeah, our, our folks have been very uh, uh, excellent. I, you know, I can't say enough good things about the about our people, of Madison County, and our, our principals, our teachers, and, and everyone willing to to jump in and, and work together and um, make sure that we get everything taken care of. Well, this twenty-page document is extremely thorough, so yeah. it's. Right, thank you. I joked earlier that there was no way that you could summarize it, but you did. So we appreciate that. But it's extreme. It. It's it's wonderful, and I'm anxious to hear what our parents and our teachers and our staff and everyone yeah. how they feel about it. It uh, you know, 21 pages to say wash your hands and wear a mask. <laughs> Stay yeah. six it's feet very away. Solid. <laughs> but uh, the, but there is a lot more to it than the that. The safety yeah, precautions are 110 percent. Yes. I mean. As better a, off at school than you are in Walmart, I can tell you. Yes. I'll be honest with you, when I sat down and read this for two hours last night, I looked at it with my nurse's eye mm -hmm. to try to find something that I didn't agree with, and I couldn't. You know, it, it really, it, it's, it appeared to me that you all followed the CDC, the State Department of Health, KDE, just I've been watching and reading and it's studying. Studying. You all know how to do that. <laughs> but like I said, I looked for something that didn't meet the criteria. And in this plan, I just couldn't find anything. So I think you all did a great job on it. Are there any other questions? Okay. Then. I need a motion to approve the return to school plan as presented by Dr. Gillum. So moved. The motion's been made by Mr. Rutherford. Is there a second? I'll second. Second been made by Mrs. Cobb. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposition? All right, motion carries. I will just say that we've had the assurance that we're going to revisit this again in August at our meeting. If things change and if things and situations change, I, I think we're all available we to doing a, you know special call meetings and doing whatever we need to do. So. Yeah, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, yeah, we're the the whole plan is predicated on being able to adjust to the the you know, the information that's out there and, and our current situation, and uh, and that's we wanted to make sure that we built a plan that was sustainable through all situations and, and a plan for the entire year, not just um, not just one to, to get us going at the beginning of the year, but one that could, could sustain us the entire year. And, uh, uh, and as you see, if, if conditions change and, and um, whatever that situation is, I feel that we're, you know, we're ready to, to uh, pivot in whatever direction we need to go. We're not done with you yet. Okay. Moving on to number eight, to authorize the superintendent to allocate and adjust previously approved student support, student support specialist positions. That's hard to say. It is, yes. Uh, so what, we, uh, what I'm requesting here is, if, if you remember at, the, at our last board meeting, talking about the virtual piece and some of the other, things, other needs that we, uh, that we might have, uh, we approved a, uh, we approved uh, several of those student support specialist positions to be able to to meet that as I have worked with uh, our principals in developing specifically that plan uh, we're not going to need quite as many individuals as what we had, had talked about however uh, we will need uh, some of those will need teacher certification okay so uh, that changes the the uh, the one piece just a little bit so what I'm requesting, because this is such a fluid piece, uh, you know, ordinarily if we create a teacher position, we would you know, create a teacher position at whatever uh, um, school. 
since this is such a fluid piece right now, I'm, uh, I'm basically uh, asking that you just give me the ability to take that, uh, those positions that we have, mold them and shape them into something that will work for us. And uh, um, it will not exceed, uh, it will not exceed the budget that we had set aside for the, uh, for the, uh, for the first group. So, so we should be fine. Uh, in, in terms of budgetary needs, but some of the positions, it's it's just going to depend on how we uh, how we need that in, in terms of what we need to do. All right, and with that, um, this is the stuff I had mentioned earlier that I left on the uh, the printer up there, or left in my office. So, and I am uh, I got to follow protocol here. If you're up and moving, you got to put on a mask. So. Uh, I will quickly give you guys the, uh, this is a rundown, just uh, so you can see it, of, the, uh, of where we are. And because last meeting and this meeting I mentioned multiple times, uh, you may have heard of what we would, uh, at the last meeting in particular, we may have mentioned several times, oh, this is, uh, we'll be paying for that repairs funding. So uh, this actually is a, a breakdown of kind of where we are and what we've done so far with uh, expenses. And uh, <clears throat> so I just kind of walk you through that just real quickly because it is uh, it's pertinent to the uh, um, to the piece that we were just referring to. The uh, the <clears throat> the different pieces there that we have uh, uh, that we have looked at uh, that we have approved and you can see I've got the teachers and aides on there of course that's a that's a ballpark that is uh, the numbers I have on there the total budget there is significantly less than what we had actually uh, uh, approved last time because I don't think we're gonna it's gonna take quite that many to uh, to do what we need to do the nurse will be presented to you at the next board meeting uh, we do have a little bit of additional staff time because some, some of our folks have worked on have, as much as anything, it's our high schools working with their with, the, with their students to uh, to uh, get those schedules lined out, and then you can see the extensive uh, PPE that we have purchased, and that kind of gives you an idea of what we have on hand. Sixty-three thousand surgical, excuse me, sixty-three thousand surgical masks, nineteen cases of N95s, two hundred fifty cases of KN95, twenty-one hundred boxes of gloves. surgical gowns, face shields. Um, those face shields are for some of our folks that, uh, uh, that work with, uh, that will be working with our students very kind of close face to face. They will wear a mask and put a face shield over to prevent anything from going in uh, into the eyes. Mainly that's for some of our, uh, our um, folks working with their therapy services, uh, OTPT and some, some other pieces like that. Uh, we purchased UV sanitizers for every school, and, uh, and actually every school will have two of those. Uh, one that we purchased through uh, the maintenance piece, and the other one we purchased through food service. Um, uh, hand soap descent, uh, dispensers, paper towel dispensers, we uh, bought those for every school, every classroom that has a sink in it. And then uh, I mentioned Virex a few minutes ago, and we have... 400 bottles of that, and just so you'll know, a bottle of Virex makes about 170 gallons of, of uh, disinfectant, so we could disinfect uh, the county 10 times over, probably. Uh, so the, uh, the other uh, spray fog machines, electrostatic uh, uh, disinfectant machines, um, we had to buy additional trash cans uh, in order to be able to accommodate our uh, in-classroom food, uh, food service. And then we've done water fountain. Uh, well, we haven't done those yet, but we've got them. Uh, um, we have these items ordered, and we're going to install the water fountain modifications so that those water fountains will uh, that we will have at least one water fountain in each building that is a bottle uh, water bottle uh, dispenser or filler uh, filling station. Um, we have uh, we purchased uh, anti fog spray and anti fog wipes for our uh, bus drivers. Because you know, if you anyone any of you that wear glasses, you put the put the mask yes. on, it will fog your glasses up. And uh, we have a lot of our our um, 
bus drivers that wear the glasses, so so that will uh, that will help with them. And then we uh, we have a um, uh, some signage there. We have several things that we're uh, we. Uh, we had those printed up so that we could distribute and post uh, the signs and th so forth throughout the district. So, um, and you notice the one column out there, um, FEMA eligible. If it is uh, something that is uh, meets the FEMA guidelines, we are able to request reimbursement from FEMA at 75% of that. So that kind of gives you a breakdown of those items that were FEMA eligible. So you can see our expenses that we have so far. We had, uh, and then uh, the total of all of those expenses uh, is right there, our CARES Act funding, and then the amount we can get back from FEMA gives us kind of an, a net that would still be available for emergency funds after all of, all of these pieces. And you know, as of right now, I think we're in pretty good shape with this list of items. Did, have we evaluated the need for additional custodial staff? We have not. Uh, we have evaluated it. Yes, okay. mm -hmm. yes, okay. and and uh, you know we may come back and and, and do a little bit of uh, yeah. W one of the that was uh, part of that piece was to meet with the uh, as I said, Mr. Cash met with the, uh, the the representatives today, and the purpose behind that is to find out. Uh, we have to nail down specifically their what not just what they tell us, but what they will actually put in writing is guaranteeing us to. The, the solutions and how you actually put it on and apply it and everything in order to uh, to get the um, the virus kill that we require and um, depending on um, how all that works out can really change our cleaning procedures if it's something we can just spray on that doesn't take as long but if it's if there's uh, uh, wiping required and some other things then that extends uh, the, the cleaning time so we're evaluating that if we uh, if we need additional staff we'll certainly come back to the board as you can see even with uh, with what we have here we still have some um, some additional pieces but at the same time though a lot of our a lot of our um, um, cleaning efforts can kind of be uh, repurposed I suppose yeah <coughs> we do have additional cleaning procedures like with our cafeteria staff well, our cafeteria staffs going uh, doing you know classroom to classroom so that kind of changes that a little bit and that shifts that out if you look at the amount of time that our custodians typically spend in a cafeteria cleaning that's a pretty good time during the day that they're actually in there focused on that they will not have that area when students aren't moving around the building as much there's a lot of that those common area areas that don't have to be cleaned the way that they typically would when you don't have after school activities uh, to the degree that we usually do Again, that's your your night crew is not having to to follow that. So there's there's opportunity for doing additional sanitizing and disinfecting and cleaning because we're not having to do some other things, okay? Or we're changing the areas that we're doing those in. So once we get that completely mapped out, you know, if we need additional staff, I I will certainly uh, come back to the board and, and request that. But and as you can see, we still have some some funding there where that could be made available. Can you give us just a, a helicopter view of, of what you know daily cleaning protocols are going to be in the buildings? What, what parents can and teachers can expect? Yeah. So um, uh, two or three things. One, you know, our, just our typical you know, typical cleaning going through doing the you know doing the uh, the mopping, the dusting, and all of that. Plus, um, you know, our custodians are going to be doing uh, continual. Uh, throughout the day uh, disinfecting those high touch areas and we're going to try to restrict that uh, or not restrict it but uh, but reduce that as much as the need for that as much as possible by leaving some doors open as much as possible now we have our safety regs and, and, and so forth but uh, there are certain areas that we can leave open that uh, that where people would not touch that so that's not as necessary but uh, but they'll go through and clean those high touch areas continually throughout the day uh, and then um, every uh, every day we will do the um, uh, disinfectant. Uh, every every classroom will have a have a disinfectant spray bottle. We'll disinfect the uh, the um, uh, the desktops in every classroom, uh, and also with those frequent areas going in the restrooms and, and other things. We have the hand wash stations that that our cafeteria folks will push around for the um, uh, for the hand washing at the uh, uh, at meal times and. Uh, 
uh, and also, as I mentioned, all of our all of our classrooms, a lot of our elementary classrooms already have sinks in them, so they'll be they'll be doing that. But it's really just using using the heck out of that Virex and, and spraying it, wiping it off. That's that that's the biggest thing that's going to be different. Will that be going on? Like, I know most of the the buildings are doing some sort of block scheduling, so mm -hmm. we're limiting how much they're moving. Are they going to be, you know, wiping and swiping, you know? every hour or between every class change or what yes yeah, certainly between every class change they would be going through and and uh and, and, who will be and hitting doing those that, that would be our custodians, custodians? yes mm -hmm. yeah we have those daytime custodians they would be doing that during class changes mm -hmm. okay. absolutely yes or following those class changes yeah and uh, and again, every you know every building is kind of unique, and so you know we're going to work with our principals to make sure that we ha we had that uh, have that covered. And as well, uh, another piece that that we that we have is, if you'll recall, we did approve those um, those uh, um, yeah, basically we call them I think emergency uh, aids mm -hmm. aid positions. So we have those available, and as I go through working with those um, with our uh, with our building principals, if they need additional people such as that, those are positions that have already been approved. And as such, we also said that we would furlough if uh, those workers, if we, you know, if we went to a virtual piece and did not need them in the building. Those are m completely focused on making sure that we meet all of our uh, needs when kids are in, per in, in person. So, uh, so that's the other option that we have with that. And those job descriptions did allow for, for that to do. Uh, within there. I know like, we've already in our buying all of these cleaning supplies, mm -hmm. but like normal annual when parents go to the stores, are they going to be supplying classrooms with mm. hand sanitizer and tissues well, uh, and paper towels? We uh, we have we've had brief conversations about that, about your you know, your back to school list. Right. The um, we haven't landed anything uh, definite yet with our principals, but reality is uh, you know what what do we typically ask for hand sanitizer and uh, wipes yes. uh, you, know, you can get the hand sanitizer right now you can't get the disinfectant wipes it, it would drive our parents crazy so I'm pretty confident they're not going to ask that they supply that um, what we have supplied what we would typically ask parents to do or, or kids everybody to chip in we are providing those we're not providing the wipes because you simply can't get them right now but we are providing a bottle of Virex and the uh, and the uh, paper towels in each classroom, and then we are also uh, providing uh, the uh, gallon of hand sanitizer in each classroom to begin school, and we'll replace that as needed. So, uh, so we're going to provide the the cleaning th those two particular items. Yeah. But if someone wants to donate, if it, someone wants to donate, to we would. I'm sure their teachers would love to have it. <laughs> right. Absolutely, yes. We're not right. going to turn that away. Get your hands on it. Nor would we ever. Right. Yes. Yeah. Well, I think the safety protocols are very thorough. Even the um, emotional health, I, I, it's exciting to see that. I appreciate it. Yeah, that, I appreciate that. And one, uh, I'll also throw that at, throw something out there. You know, with our uh, with our guidance counselors, you know, they're mm -hmm. and uh, our other uh, you know, our school psychs and everything. They're we're going to have a lot on their plate this year, and they know it. Um, you know, regardless of, of of what happens throughout the year, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a challenge for them to uh, to meet all the school needs. And and I can't say enough great things about our family resource youth service center directors. Uh, they've been getting together regularly and having conversations about kids and how to meet the needs of kids. You know, ever since we, you know, they do it year round, but especially since we shut down in in March. So. So basically, out of tonight's meeting, is we are starting school. It is going to be the three choices, and parents need to get on our website and see the different uh, information that they need for their student, right? As of now, we're planning on, on being in person. And at, then, uh, um, the individual schools are going to break it down a little bit more for mm -hmm. yes. them. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because yeah. I think that's the big thing is the not knowing what you're doing plan. Yeah. So the more we can put that out there for mm -hmm. the parents to feel comfortable and the teachers sure I, mean, I think they should be getting in it in the know before we do but mm -hmm. I'm sure that everybody wants to feel safe yeah, everyone certainly wants to feel safe and yeah the another thing not only do you have the safety 
the safety component, but you know, people like security and they like to know what's going on. And one, one thing we realized through this uh, with, the, with the coronavirus is it, you know, it, it's disrupted everyone's plans and no one knows you know, what next week is going to look like, where, you know, what, what we're going to need, what precautions are we going to need to take and, and everything else. And so uh, uh, it's taken away that, you know, you know, we talk about that sense of normalcy, but it's also taken away that sense of security in just knowing. And, and that creates uh, anxiety with everyone. Mm -hmm. And uh, I certainly, yeah, uh, I certainly know that. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. You put yourself in that category. I would. I yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you a funny story real quickly. I, I went uh, to the uh, um, um, the auto shop uh, a week or so ago and walked in, and the uh, the gentleman there said uh, said I got a question for you. I said, Well, what is it? He said, Have you seen any good movies lately? And I looked at him kind of funny. He said. I just figured you'd want a question other than when school going to start. So <laughs> I said, well, I appreciate that very much. So thank you. <laughs> You're like, thanks for that. Yes. All right. Any other questions? All right. So still on agenda item number eight, I need a motion to authorize Superintendent Gillum to allocate and adjust the previously approved student support specialist personnel positions as needed to meet the distance learning needs of students and schools. Second. All right, the motion's been made by Mrs. Brock, second by Mrs. Coyle. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposition? Motion carries. Moving on to number nine, I need a motion to adjourn. So moved. Motion's been made by Mr. Rutherford. Is there a second? I'll second. Second has been made by Mrs. Cobb. All those in favor? Aye. Any opposition? Okay. We are adjourned.